So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, welcome here at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. For those of you who have been here on Thursday, you obviously realize that my worst has not gotten better, so it's even worse than, than at that time. But anyway, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to introduce Michael Mann, uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, obviously, it will be a rather short introduction because last Thursday he has gotten a rather long laudatio and I won't repeat myself. So instead of that, I just would like to say a few words about him and about the context of the talk. Uh, the talk of last Thursday was about the end, or was it the ending of war or the fading away of war? And he engaged very much with the thesis of Steven Pinker, a rather famous thesis, uh, hotly debated right now. And one pro could probably say that that was an attempt to theorize and to analyze in macrosociological terms. Tonight's talk, I believe, I don't know, will more of a kind of microsociological endeavor because he will talk about fear and loathing on the battlefield, which is a very close look into the reality of the battle. Now, we are really looking forward to this talk, but before that, I will just say a few words about Michael Mann himself. He is Professor Emeritus at the UCLA in Los Angeles, uh, professor of sociology, of course. Uh, he's the author of the famous The Sources of Social Power, a four-volume work as a kind of a history of uh, power, world history of power. And he has written numerous books on the dark side of democracy, for example, where he has focused on uh, genocide and uh, war crimes. And what he's uh, doing right now, he's doing a kind of a research in war and the micro and micro dynamics of war. And we are really looking forward to what he has to say tonight. Michael Mann, as the OBD of the Siegfried Lanzut Prize, this is the second lecture. We are really proud to have you here again. Thank you, uh, Wolfgang. Um, I am working at the moment on military power, hence these talks. And this one is a bit about um, micro, I suppose, uh, phenomena. It's about um, soldiers in battle. What do they feel like? Do they, are they dominated by fear? Do they have moral qualms about killing? Um, or what? Those are the issues, the main issues. Now, these are very traditional issues about whether people like killing or whether they hate killing, whether they refuse to kill. Um, and it involves uh, myths about human nature, that man, usually man, uh, as a willing killer and woman with what, uh, moral qualms. But some people have argued that, uh, in fact, all soldiers feel moral qualms, or the vast majority do. Now, of course, uh, if we think about things in macro terms, we find that war is ubiquitous. It seems to be um, a, a feature of human activity, uh, which we are never fully without for long periods of time in any one place. But, of course, it's worth reminding ourselves that peace is far commoner when you get statistics like the Roman Empire, sorry, the Roman Republic um, was at war for every year except three for 400 years, that's probably the most militaristic society there's ever been. But it doesn't mean if you live somewhere in one particular place in the Roman Empire, Roman Republic, sorry, um, that you experience war. What it means is that the Roman Republic is somewhere at war in that time each year, or almost every year. And so peace is much more common than the statistics of war might make you think. And most conflicts are settled by diplomacy, conciliation. Political scientists have developed this new term, militarized 
interstate disputes, uh, which are little skirmishes after which the sides get together and somehow or other co cobble together perhaps a temporary solution to the problem, and there are far more of those than there are of wars. <coughs> now, there's also a historical myth, which I dealt with uh, last week, uh, which is uh, that there is a transition from militarism to p uh, pacifism in modern societies. Um, and in modern societies, violence may be... Uh, um, Uh, violence tends to be, in Randall Collins' terms, incompetence. He's done this major study of small-scale fights and violence in, in modern societies. And he finds that human beings are not very good at fighting. That they, rather than the way that things are shown in movies where you punch people straight, they're more likely to slap bystanders very rarely get drawn in, and uh, there's a lot of bravado and, and threatening, but very little action. <coughs> and um, there's also uh, arisen recently uh, a strong belief that human beings have moral qualms about killing, which will prevent uh, many of them from killing even if they are soldiers. And that's the argument of uh, Pinker, who I dealt with last week. Uh, but also, the American um, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Marshall, whose work I will deal with uh, in a few minutes. And Marshall is someone who did not exactly surveys, but he did a lot of interviewing of American soldiers in World War II, and uh, he came up with the conclusion that very few of them ever fi fired their weapons because of moral qualms. <coughs> and though people have been a little suspicious of his methods, nonetheless his conclusion has been endorsed by a whole slew of sociologists and historians and political scientists. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to question uh, that. Uh, of course, we do get in this period what I referred to last time is a change in the nature of war from ferocious body slashing, aiming at the body directly of the other person uh, to callous long distance violence w without emotion, typified by bombing. And the start, my starting point, the Battle of Gettysburg, in the American Civil War, 1863, uh, is a kind of transition point. Because at that point, the soldiers are firing guns, but at very short distances, and they also carry bayonets. And so there's a mixture of ferocious and not exactly long distance callous, but quite uh, uh, distance of, uh, well, they're supposed to uh, not fire until the enemy gets within 30 meters, yards actually, uh, of them. Uh, but uh, they tend to start firing earlier, uh, as, as we'll see. <coughs> and at the end of my period, Raqqa, the Battle of Raqqa uh, in 2017, uh, was largely the uh, ISIS, or Daesh, was uh, largely destroyed by drones bombing long-range artillery in which the killers never saw their victims. Okay, <clears throat> So there's a, a shift in this period in the nature of war experience. So the main question is, uh, do fear or moral qualms dominate, and can they be managed and overcome? Now, I'm going to be looking at battlefields from the U.S. Civil War onwards. And I can't obviously deal with all of them uh, now. But the, the reason to start with the American Civil War is this uh, is the first predominantly literate society 
80% uh, white literacy in the United States. And so we have thousands of letters and diaries by soldiers back home to their loved ones describing what their life in battle is like. <coughs> and these were as yet uncensored because the American Civil War Army authorities hadn't gotten round yet to censoring these, let these letters, unlike the world wars of the 20th century where one uh, finds uh, that there is a lot of censorship of soldiers', soldiers letters home. <coughs> now, in all previous battles, we know nothing whatever directly of the experience of ordinary soldiers. Uh, John Keegan wrote a wonderful book in which he imagined an imaginative reconstruction of what the experience of ordinary soldiers was, the battles of uh, uh, Agincourt, Waterloo, and the Somme in World War I. Uh, but it's, and it's a brilliant book, but he doesn't actually have any real evidence for it because the soldiers were none of them literate or oh, the ordinary soldiers. So the American Civil War gives us a new opportunity. And World War II gives us another opportunity, the first appearance of modern sociological methods interviewing individual soldiers, and uh, especially airmen, pilots, uh, about their experience of war and getting quantitative analysis of it. So I'm going to be talking about both of these, uh, especially, and I'm going to be focusing, when I come to the World Wars and Korea, on uh, infantry and uh, fighter pilots. Oops. Oh, yes. Again, uh, there are myths that people enlisting have. Uh, the, the, of the war they expect or hope for. So war is a struggle between hero, heroism and cowardice, and obviously one is going to be a hero, uh, but one fears, perhaps, that one instead will be a coward. And, of course, the enlistment, en main enlistment uh, motivations are two. On the one hand, the young men's... Uh, desire for adventure, heroism, and the, the machismo, the, the masculinity of, uh, of heroic um, uh, violence. Uh, the second alternative is it's a secure job with perhaps upward mobility, good pay, pension. <laughs> and that's, you know, these are the two main reasons for enlistment in contemporary armies. <clears throat> However, these myths are immediately shattered when the soldier gets into battle. Uh, nothing can quite adequately describe uh, what that first experience of battle is, but it's horrific. Uh, all around, bodies are getting mangled, there's chaos, and in modern warfare, it's uh, somewhat random. Most deaths come from the air, uh, suddenly, uh, apparently randomly, uh, and uh, uh, either death or mut mutilation is all around. And there's a loss of control because of these weapons coming through the air or uh, improvised explosive devices now in the struggle against uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, militias. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, I just, I'll just read a, a couple of uh, experiences of, of this, of letters. Um, the American historian Macpherson has analyzed over 1,000 letters and diaries of American soldiers on both sides in the Civil War. And they reveal that soldiers do experience their first battle especially as horrific, utterly different from the adventure story they'd anticipated. A private wrote, I have seen enough of the glory of war. I am sick of seeing dead men and men's limbs torn from their bodies. 
a sergeant wrote, I don't know any individual soldier who is at all anxious to be led or driven, for that matter, to another battle. And a captain confessed to his wife, This has broken me down completely. I'm in a state of exhaustion. I never saw the brigade so completely broken down and unfitted for service. Or again, World War I, French infantryman Marcel Papillon writing to his parents, it's shameful, awful. It's impossible to convey the image of such a carnage. We will never be able to escape from such a hell. The dead cover the ground. Bosch and French are piled on top of each other in the mud. We attacked twice and gained a little ground which was completely soaked with blood. But one must not despair. One can be wounded. As for death, if it comes, it will be a deliverance. Now note that his hope is to be wounded, and then he will be uh, back into civilian life. Well, they say, they, they say themselves it's impossible to describe this, but they go on to describe it. <coughs> so that there's an existential fear, which is highest before the battle, before any battle, during especially the first battle, and when passive under fire, that is when you're receiving fire and you're not doing anything yourself, and when defeat looms, and when flight begins, and flight is utter terror, utter panic. <coughs> There are also physiological consequences. In the studies of World War II, about 70% of the American soldiers um, report heart pounding so that they have difficulty in breathing, um, <coughs> trembling all over, and about 25% of them say they uh, vomited or they urinated or uh, defecated um, involuntarily. <coughs> so the response of many soldiers is to shirk that English wor word which means to, uh, to, to slink away to the side, to the back, to keep your head right down, to not, never volunteer for anything, to t take things as lightly as you can. <clears throat> perhaps to pretend to fire and uh, report st sick and uh, self-wounding, self-wounding typically of the feet uh, in, uh, in the war two world wars. <clears throat> now, there are he heroes, but they're very much disliked by their comrades. There are a few people who are uh, real killers, as, we, as it were, and who um, uh, rush forward with a surge of adrenaline from the adrenaline glands and described by others as madmen um, acting out of character and disliked because they draw the enemy fire on you as well on the people around the hero. So heroes are not popular, nor, of course, are shirkers, because then the burden falls on those who are not shirking. <coughs> now, generals fully recognize that they're scared that the soldiers are scared. And uh, this is what two American generals said about World War II. Uh, General Patton said, courage is fear holding on a minute longer. That is, holding on a minute longer than the enemy. The enemy's also scared. 
and both sides are scared. They're not very effective as fighters. Uh, and their courage is you're holding on a minute longer than the enemy. General Bradley said, Bra bravery uh, is the capacity to form properly even when scared half to death. <clears throat> so it's fully recognized by army authorities what this is. Now, <clears throat> I'm now going to be talking about uh, the people who argue that soldiers have moral qualms. I'm going to disagree with them, I'm afraid. Uh, Grossman, who's the first of two uh, lieutenant generals I'll discuss in the uh, American Army, uh, who has written interesting books about the Civil War. And he made two arguments about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, one is on the basis of finding uh, of the uh, Union Army reporting that there were 24,000 abandoned and loaded muskets left on the battlefield at Gettysburg. And Grossman argues that this has to be as a result of people pretending to fire, of getting up there doing this, and uh, then uh, uh, not firing. Um, and his uh, argument has been taken uh, um, seriously by most uh, historians. But um, I tracked down his source, which was a, a report written by the Army Orden Union Army Ordnance <laughs> Department in 1865, which said that these musket muskets, describing these muskets, this is the source uh, this short report on them, it says the muskets were prone to faults. They needed 17 to 18 reloading movements by soldiers who in the American Civil War were often very lightly trained, if at all, because these armies were suddenly enormously enlarged among Americans who never fired weapons. <coughs> and that was beyond them. And so they would drop the musket because out of incompetence. And perhaps they'd pick up another one uh, uh, or, or, or whatever. But um, uh, it, the original author makes no indication that it might be pretend firing. He says it's a combination of faulty muskets and incompetent uh, soldiers. The second thing that uh, Grossman points to is massive overfiring and a low casualty rate indicating deliberate off-target firing. But there's no suggestion of this at all in the 1,000 letters and diaries uh, studied by Macpherson. Uh, if we... Uh, Uh, you know, one further quote, uh, the sociologist uh, Milosevic, Sinisa Milosevic, who's written good books on war, um, accepts Grossman's argument and calls it deliberate mock firing, pretending to fire because of moral qualms. He calls it, he says, killing is in fact terribly difficult, messy, guilt-ridden, and for most people an ab abhorrent activity though he does hedge his bets a bit by saying that soldiers become, also become paralyzed by fear alongside this conscious inability to kill other human beings. So morality tinged with fear is his argument. So if we move on to World War II, we get the originator of this idea, who uh, the uh, Lieutenant General Marshall, who um, very much influenced Grossman. Grossman acknowledges that, but Marshall wrote first, and he wrote about World War II. And what he did was not individual interviews with soldiers, but assemble whole companies of infantrymen together and have a conversation with them. 
and he reported on the basis of this that only 20 to 25 percent ever fired their weapons due to moral qualms. <clears throat> which is astonishingly low. And Marshall says, it's therefore reasonable to believe that the average and healthy individual still has such an inner and usually unrealized resistance to killing a fellow man that he will not, of his own volition, <coughs> take life if it is possible for him to turn away from that possibility. At the vital point, he becomes a conscientious objector, unknowingly. <coughs> now, increasingly from the 1980s, doubts began to be expressed about his methods. <coughs> and some of the authors uh, commenting on him in this list of them there note that some doubts have been expressed, but they all go on to accept what uh, Marshall says. <coughs> but it's now become obvious that Marshall actually falsified his data. He never asked the soldiers about firing. His sparse notes don't mention non-firing. Indeed, they don't mention any numbers at all. There are no numbers. His assistant, from whom we uh, get this, who wrote about it after Marshall died, uh, said that Marshall said that statistics were an adornment of belief, meaning you believe things and you invent statistics. <coughs> now, Marshall continued. Marshall was a greatly respected uh, uh, military theorist, and his argument had influenced uh, the American military into devising new training methods, and he later did two further reports, one in the Korean War, same methods, dubious, but he reported 55% fired their weapons. And then in Vietnam, 90%. So he says there was a great improvement as a result of the innovations that he suggested. It, I think that the improvement is unlikely. There's no evidence that they um, <coughs> that they uh, ever did uh, uh, speak to him in those terms. And there are various forms of World War II uh, evidence which show that the non-firers are rare, under 10 percent, and they're incapacitated by fear, not qualms. Now, fighter pilots are interesting because they are up there in the sky alone. And so you can see clearly what the individual pilot is doing. <coughs> and a few did most of the killing. And these are the different sources which reveal that a few pilots did most of the killing. The ones who were called aces, with five or more kills, uh, were only 1% of pilots uh, of, of, in World War II of the, the US Air Force. But they killed between 37% and 68% of, uh, of enemy planes. They downed them, according to the different theaters of war. Most pilots had no kills. And if you go through the others, um, sources, you find the same thing. That uh, <coughs> uh, for the RAF as well, I'm sorry, I don't have any data at all on the, on the Luftwaffe, uh, or for that matter, on the Japanese. Uh, uh, let me comment on the Korean War. There's a claim that half their pilots uh, never fired their guns, the American pilots and that only 10% of them ever hit the target. And this is quoted and re-quoted uh, across the literature, and I'm sure you're, uh, you've met in your own areas of research, these kind of research myths. 
and you go back and try and find the original, and the original uh, says only this, two sentences on this, it's by two military psychologists, and there's no source given, and they go on, they're psychologists, and they go on to say, of course, uh, and this is at great length, uh, we need more, more psychological training of soldiers, and we need more psych psychologists employed in the armed forces. There's no source. Well, most of the pilots didn't kill. Why not? Or, uh, was it fear or was it moral qualms? Well, there are four reasons. It is an extraordinary, it was extraordinarily skilled military occupation. It's uh, flying a plane going at several hundred miles an hour, kilometers an hour, um, <coughs> involves a whole sequence of split-second decisions. Uh, on a typical mission, nothing happens, you fly for most of the time, and then suddenly there's action, and you have to take um, uh, 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 very quickly, uh, instantaneously, decisions and maneuvers and fire your guns at the same time. Accidents, very large quantity. These RAF figures, uh, 6,000 non-combat deaths of pilots and crews in planes. And flying and firing at the same time was beyond the skill levels of many of the pilots. The second one is a statistical artifact. Uh, novices die uh, before firing. Their replacements increase pilot totals but not the number of kills. The kill is the downing of an enemy plane. The novices are often consumed by fear, but was this cause or result of skill lacking? The third one is that it's the allied figures, the American and British figures, are somewhat art of an artifact because most Allied missions were in 1944 to 5. You know, the plane production is constantly increasing. There are more and more planes in action. And most of the enemy planes, the Luftwaffe and the Japanese, were by then destroyed. And the fighter's job is only escorting bombers, deterring the remaining German fighters from coming up and attacking the bombers. And so the fighters rarely saw enemy fighters. And the flak fire from the ground was aimed at the bombers who were about to drop their bombs on your city and not on the fighters. So uh, you have these very low statistics in the last two years of the war where you can see that uh, only one in, in over four years, they, they fired in one out of three missions, the average pilot, in the last year, two years, it's only one in 25. Right. But the biggest thing, factor is a selection. The best pilots are given the best planes. And they're given the leadership role in the flight. Now, the American flight pattern was one of four planes. What's called the leader, his wingman, which, whose, uh, the leader, his mission is to down enemy fighters, to kill enemy fighters. The wingman is to protect the leader. And then there's a second pair of planes, and the leader of those two will replace the first leader if he's uh, out of action for some reason, and his wingman protects him. So... Typically, only one of four pilots is, is supposed to kill. And the leader, which we know these figures from Korea, actually, the leader's got 82% of the kills. The other three rarely had the chance. So the reason that the aces killed so many is that they were given the leadership role because they were the best pilots. <coughs> However, Korean war pilots, two of them, did say that between 10 and 20% of their colleagues were useless 
but that was because of fear and their lack of confidence in their skills. There's no mention of any qualms, except for one thing. The pilots of all of the, uh, uh, all of the air forces involved on both sides <coughs> did not shoot at ejecting pilots. For them, the kill was the downing of the plane, not the pilot. So hopefully the pilot got out, got, went out in his parachute and parachuted down, and they were never fired on. That was the moral qualm. <coughs> now, the, the casualty rate of all of these pilots uh, was very high. Casualty rate means killed, wounded, or missing, and prisoners of war. Uh, and they had a, th a three out of four chance of this happening. Only 25% got through the war uh, with no damage. Of course, it must have been much worse in the Luftwaffe and the Japanese Air Force. Uh, because they were being defeated. I don't know what the survival rate of German pilots was, but it must be lower than 25%. But in the Allied forces, and probably in the other ones as well, pilot morale was the highest of all. And here we come to the first mention of Samuel Stufer, American sociologist who led a research project from the University of Michigan, um, interviewing very large numbers of individual American soldiers and airmen. And he found, they found, that the pilot morale was the highest of all, of all American troops, even though they had the highest casualty rate. But that was because, for two reasons, two main reasons, they had no time to be fear, to be frightened, because of this uh, activity consuming the mind, uh, split session, second decisions. Uh, and if you haven't got that, you're concentrating hard on the next button to push or whatever, uh, and you've got no time to be afraid. And the second thing is they derive very high status, especially if they were an ace. Because in all air forces, including the German and Japanese, uh, an ace getting five or more kills was treated as a hero. And therefore, they had every incentive to carry on. So there's only this limited case of, uh, of uh, qualms of not firing on other pilots when they're out of the plane. There's one case where an American pilot says uh, he felt uh, tremendous sympathy for a German pilot, at, uh, sorry, a Korean, uh, a Chinese pilot, <laughs> sorry, this is uh, Korea I'm talking about, a Chinese pilot uh, who he could see very clearly was trapped inside a burning cockpit and couldn't get out. And he was in agony. And the American pilot uh, shot and killed him uh, to save him um, you know, unbearable pain and followed by death. That's the only case that, uh, where of these many pilot reports, um, there's a kind of a clearly a moral qualm. Now, the infantry overfiring, which Grossman had first noticed in Gettysburg. Sorry, the non firing uh, and then overfiring. In all of these wars, officers complain of overfiring, not non firing. That is, their soldiers are firing far too much inaccurately. Uh, and why are they doing that? Well, <coughs> <clears throat> you can say about G Gettysburg, there's the musket inaccuracy and the incompetence of the, of the soldiers. 
but immediately afterwards, you get better breech loading uh, muskets or rifles. And they had the effect of increasing the number of shots fired, but not the casualties. And this tendency goes right through the 20th century and into the 21st century. The World War I casualty rate, one casualty, that is a, uh, someone killed or significantly wounded, per 10,000 shots. So there are 10,000 shots fired for every casualty, every death or serious wounding. But in World War II, it doubles one casualty per 20,000 shots. And then in Vietnam, with automatic weapons, one casualty per 50,000. And then in the 21st century, Iraq and Afghanistan, one to 250,000. So there's a continuous trend towards less killing efficiency. Well, why? Are they firing deliberately high? Probably not. The basic cause is that passivity is unbearable when you're getting incoming fire from anywhere or bombing from anywhere. And this business about dispelling fear with activity, which we saw <coughs> with the pilots, uh, is attempted by infantrymen. They blaze away. But the more... Uh, it's a kind of... <laughs> In Gettysburg, they're supposed to wait until the enemy is 30 metres away. They start when they're 100 metres away because they're receiving artillery fire and they can't do anything about it. And the instinctive reaction is to fire back. <coughs> but the weapons, weapons are getting more and more lethal. At Gettysburg, the guys are standing up. Luckily, the weapons are so inaccurate that they have a reasonable chance of not getting hit. But of course, when you get to modern weapons, especially automatic weapons, you stand up, you're dead. Exposure is fatal. So you blaze away from cover to stop incoming fire. Because if you fire heavily at the more or less source of the firing that's coming at you, you get them to duck down as well. So both sides are ducking down, with the, pointing their gun in the general direction of the enemy and firing away, uh, but, build, but not exposing themselves. Fear is the cause, but it also firing does fulfill a sense of duty. But there's no evidence of any qualms. So the generals thought that uh, fear could be managed. How is this done? Well, firstly, there's a number of coercions. There's rigorous drilling so that the soldier loses his individuality and becomes just a, a, a cog in a machine. Uh, and you do things without thinking. You get the order, you do it. The second is if you don't, there's very harsh discipline. Okay, deserters are shot. Um, <coughs> uh, if you refuse orders, you, you, you might get shot as well, or you'll certainly be put in the front line. <coughs> and there's a general, you know, strong discipline. Um, then thirdly, the battlefield itself is a kind of prison. Uh, and the, 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 the army layout is a kind of prison. That you, um, you, want, you might want to run away, but you can't. You can't because you're trapped by the whole of the army formation. And ever since Gettysburg, uh, armies have employed military police in the rear to shoot or arrest anyone deserting. The other thing is the army is feeding you and giving you alcohol and tobacco. And where do you get them, especially if you're serving somewhere else abroad, say? Uh, 
um, if you, if you're, if, uh, other than with the army. So these are three kinds of coercion from outside. But the fourth one is a social coercion, what has become known as buddy theory, which is that soldiers are attached primarily to their closest comrades, not to the regiment, not to the army, not to the country. They're primarily attached to their buddies. And so obviously the theory arrived in the United States because it's buddy is an American expression, but it has been found uh, everywhere. <coughs> And since the American Civil War, we know that soldiers, above all, uh, are frightened of being identified as cowards by their close comrades. That's pass partly if they don't fire, um, then the others have to take the brunt of the firing. <coughs> So in this case, social fear undercuts the ex existential fear of dying. So these are forms of coercion, but there are also positives. The mind-absorbing activity I've already talked about, but there's also team weapons, that is, weapons that are service operated by a group like machine guns, helicopters. They are... Um, they are, in a sense, controlling each other. They're interdependent... Uh, and you can't step away from that without harming your, your uh, comrades. <coughs> that is something that Marshall had noticed. It's the one place that he was right. Uh, but secondly, if you have faith in the competence of your officers and the likelihood of victory, that adds a, a bit to morale. And so does a kind of latent sense of commitment to country or cause and a moral sense of duty of task completion. And again, uh, Samuel Stufer and the, um, and the sociologists uh, established that clearly among uh, American troops, that they, di they didn't really think that they were defending freedom or whatever or uh, attacking fascism. Uh, but they had a, uh, overwhelmingly a moral sense of duty of task completion and their country, right, right or wrong, was what they were fighting for. So the effect of all this is to produce a kind of minimally acceptable morale. You fire, but you keep your head down, you minimise the risk. You perhaps do it a moment longer than the enemy. <laughs> There are additionally two cycles that you find in world wars, in the two world wars. Uh, in a battle, soldiers are obviously not particularly effective on the first day, but they're, they're most effective between 10 and 25 days. They're, in a way, ideal soldiers from the point of view of the military authorities in that period. But after 40 days, they're emotionally shattered and they're not really capable of doing very much. That's when they have these physiological disorders of one kind or another. That's in battle. Now, in a campaign where you're sometimes fighting but sometimes preparing for the next one or marching, in, in a campaign, you get after 140 to 180 days incapacitating neuroses where officers report that they're useless for the moment. Of course, the enemy also has the same problem. So it's a case of not particularly effective soldiers fighting not particularly effective soldiers. Now, there's a, a different kind of warfare, a different kind of morale, different kind of discipline in revolutionary armies. What you get is a kind of enhanced ideological power, commitment to a cause, 
reinforced by substantial, what we would call indoctrination, and also rituals which cement this. It's a kind of participatory coercion, found especially in two Asian communist armies, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, PLA, in Korea, and the Popular Liberation Front, I'm afraid I don't know what the German acronyms would be, um, the Viet Cong, though Viet Cong is apparently a, a derogatory term which they don't, <laughs> the Vietnamese don't like to use, but it's the Vietnam War, the PLF. And here their rather mixed socialist nationalist cause is reinforced by particular rituals. The soldiers were divide, uh, divided into a threesome, three soldiers together. One would be more experienced, perhaps a Communist Party member, uh, than the other two. And they would daily meet at the end of the day and discuss what had happened in the day and what they'd done wrong. And you can accuse someone else of doing wrong or you can confess to your own wrong. <coughs> And three plus three times three of these, that is nine soldiers, um, would meet uh, at least every week with the same purpose. And then self-criticism assemblies of a whole uh, unit would be every month. And this is a form of military and political surveillance internalized by the soldiers into self-criticism. And it substitutes a kind of moral coercion for drilling and physical discipline. <coughs> now, um, the, uh, this is based, the kind of evidence that you get in Korea and uh, Vietnam is based on interviewing prisoners of war of the other side. So this is um, captured Chinese uh, and well, uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, soldiers. And uh, what they report is that they find these self-criticism meetings harder than <laughs> physical discipline, physical punishment. Uh, because it's a kind of attack on you or of, who, of your sense of who you are. And there's also a sense that you learn not necessarily to fully internalize the ideology, but to make it appear that you do. So it's not perfect, but nonetheless, the results were clear. The, the, this, this was described by themselves as, a, as a, a strategy of man over weapons, because in both cases they faced um, superior technology from Americans and from the UN forces in Korea. <coughs> and it was effective. That is, they did take incredible losses and carry on fighting. And the result was a far inferior army in terms of technology forced a draw in Korea and achieved victory in Vietnam. And these are the most striking examples of this type of uh, revolutionary army, especially the Vietnamese. Now, some of this has been argued uh, in the case of the Wehrmacht and the SS divisions on the Eastern Front. Um, I'm hesitant about this because I know there's a lot of research being done on the Wehrmacht after I did my uh, research uh, for the dark side of democracy. Um, but it does seem that core Nazis with a, um, a tremendous faith in Hitler, again, fought hard to the end despite defeats which won um, you know, right to the gates of Berlin though it has to be said that given their treatment previously of Soviet captured soldiers, uh, they, they uh, uh, had a sense of uh, 
<coughs> a fear of revenge from the Soviets if they did surrender. But we see it again among the foreign recruits to ISIS. Uh, ISIS depends not only on foreign recruits, but local recruits as well. And they appear not to be so ideological as the foreign recruits. And there's a kind of, uh, their recruitment is like to a cult, where you, uh, and you prove you're a member of the, of the loyal member of the cult by going to extremes, by committing atrocities. And also, this is the way that you attain redemption. Because, of course, many of the foreign recruits uh, were former criminals, um, see seeking redemption and being given redemption by ISIS. <coughs> well, they, after recruitment, they spent three months studying the Quran. And they were living in the caliphate. They were regarded as heroes, and the suicide bombers were superheroes. So again, they suffered heavier casualties with less flinching. <coughs> and in these cases, the kind of ideology gives a stronger form of ideological power than the kind of latent commitment to the kind of patriotism found in, in the Western armies. But in this case as well, the technical, technological odds were too great. Drones, uh, long-range artillery, um, bombing by planes too high up for you to get at, these destroyed Raqqa, and uh, have ended the territorial state of uh, ISIS. So what we find is somewhere between 5 and 10% of real killers and heroes, balanced by 5 to 10% 10, 10 of people absorbed completely by using skills, uh, and about 10 to 20% of fearful shirkers. The majority do their duty, keeping their heads down. Now, who feels qualms? Well, civilians feel qualms. If we uh, were asked to kill someone, we would, if we thought we could, we'd probably refuse. We would refuse, right? If we were under military discipline, we'd definitely hesitate. And soldiers do tend to hesitate in the first battle, but not for long not for many minutes, even seconds. Uh, and soldiers also have an ambivalence about killing prisoners and civilians. Though, of course, through this period, the proportion of civilians killed in war has risen and risen. And in the, where you're fighting guerrillas, then you are also sometimes fighting women and children. In Vietnam, women and children sometimes threw uh, hand grenades at, uh, uh, at American soldiers. So it, it isn't surprising that there were American atrocities committed against villagers in that respect. <coughs> and when soldiers were asked in World War II about killing prisoners and civilians, they were given some alternatives. Uh, and what, they, what, what, what the research has found is that if it was a context with, with prisoners where um, you uh, had to take soldiers out of the battle itself in order to guard the prisoners or to take them to the rear, uh, then the soldiers were divided about whether they should kill them or not instead because it would affect the... Uh, their ability to survive themselves. <coughs> well, I, I said this last week as well, after the first battle, if there was a democracy in the armed forces, a direct democracy, most soldiers would say, uh, I vote, I go home. Uh, enlistment is often seen as a big mistake, 
And after all, a quarter to a half of the soldiers are casualties. Uh, that's not just death, that's death and wounding combined. But I hope I've shown that fear and not moral qualms dominate soldiers' experience. But fear is managed minimally to give a minimally effective performance. And so soldiers comply not due to human nature, which is extremely varied, but to social pressures and institutionalized coercions. Military power is the most coercive form of power. It's exercised against, within the army as well as against the enemy. There is a policy conclusion that instead of war, the elderly desk killers who start wars should fight duels. Thank you.